four collapsed into each other. But now we got to look at, oh, well, let's, how about two and three? Why couldn't we collapse two and three together? Because after all, they share the same set of actions. I mean, couldn't we just put a don't care here and replace that with a don't care? And wouldn't that be OK? Well, no. It, it actually wouldn't, because if we said we don't care whether we're within limit or not, and we don't care whether we are in proper location or not, neither of those matter, well, that's not true, um, because that would erase the distinction between rule number two and rule number one, right? Uh, and obviously, rule number two and rule number one are quite different. They, uh, the, the, almost opposite in their outcomes, certainly in terms of, they, well, they are opposite in terms of approval. And, um, you know, they, they, one results in decline in the call to cardholder, and the other results in approval and no call to the cardholder. So you have to be very careful about collateral damage, if you will, that collapsing two and three would seem to be okay at first, but it would also create a situation where the, the resulting rule, um, which would be yes, yes, dash, dash, uh, would also collide with rule number one, and um, that would uh, destroy the operability of the decision table. So now that, that would not be a happy circumstance, so we don't want that to happen. Uh, same thing for rule number eight uh, and collapsing into rule seven. That was fine, but if you try to collapse rule uh, seven into six, then you would uh, erase the distinction between that and five, and then you'd see same uh, bowl of soup. So the, uh, it's important, as I said, to test these out because uh, if you don't, then um, you um, you will destroy the logic of the decision table. Now, uh, let me mention, uh, obviously, the collapse decision table, you lose uh, the uh, properties of the full decision table in terms of the formula for the number of columns, two to the number of conditions power. That's not going to apply anymore. And the regular pattern of the conditions, of course, also goes away. And you can see up here at the top half of the table, let's get this off of here. Um, we used to have that nice patterns of pattern of yeses and nos up here that you could look at and inspect. And now, of course, we don't. Um, but uh, you know, that's part and parcel of the, the benefit of, of collapsing this thing. Notice that there were we're a much smaller table now. We've got two, four, six, seven columns instead of 16. So you know anything that uh, cuts your your testing workload in half is is a good deal, um, in my opinion. You, can let, you know you might be one of those lucky people that has nothing but free time, but the most of us, uh, um, you know, free time is something we don't really have. Okay, um, so. Cause-effect graph. Now, let me start with a uh, caveat, I guess I'd say, or you know, point of <laughs> point of personal privilege. I don't really care much for these things, these cause-effect graphs. Now, uh, now, you know, if my uh, friend and colleague Gary Mosriotti is on the line listening to this, I'm sure he's just like bursting out of his skin right now because he loves these things and he thinks they're great and can make them do all sorts of magic um, from a test point of view for him anyway. Um, but I, I find them cumbersome compared to a table, which now that's not generally true for me. I'm a, I'm a picture kind of guy. I like diagrams. And you'll see in the next um, webinar, which will be the, the state-based one, or one of the subsequent webinars on state-based testing, you'll see me using a diagram. I'm perfectly happy. So I'm, I'm typically more pleased with a picture than with a, uh, than with a table of data but this is one of these cases where I simply find the table a lot more clear than the cause-effect graph in the picture. But anyway, um, the cause-effect graph, there is always an equivalent cause-effect graph for a decision table. You can convert from one to another. And uh, so if you, if for whatever reason, when you get your requirements specification or whatever the business analysts or requirements engineers give you, and it happens to include a cause-effect graph in it. And you're going, well, what do I do with this? Um, you can convert the cause-effect graph into a table and um, then use that uh, under the technique that I described before for a generation of test cases, um, either literally generating concrete test cases from 
the table or using the table itself as a logical test case. Now the conversion is um, in, involves taking a uh, uh, taking the graph and um, you're going to take the conditions out of the graph. You're going to put it on the top left uh, side of the decision table. Take the uh, actions off of the graph uh, and put those on the bottom left of the decision table. You then generate all possible combinations of conditions, and, and you already saw how to do that with the full table. And then by reading the cause-effect graph, you can determine on an action-by-action -action basis uh, which columns result in, a, in, in each action being taken or not. And so you're basically going to read off the, the graph, and um, that's going to generate the bottom half of the of the table. The top half of the table, remember, is generated automatically through the pattern of Boolean uh, or other conditional values at the top. Uh, and then once you're done generating the table, it's a full table, so if you want to collapse it, you can collapse it using the technique that I explained to you. Um, now, let me. Th this probably does not make a whole lot of sense at this point, because if you haven't seen a cause-effect graph, so let me show you cause-effect graph. Now, this is this cause-effect graph is um, equivalent to the table that I showed you uh, in previous slides. So the way that these work is that you've got, as I said, uh, you've got your conditions on the left-hand side over here. See, there they are. Real account, active account, within limit, location, OK. And then we have actions on the right-hand side, as you see over here. Okay. Uh, we also have um, an intermediate condition in here, which I will explain in just a minute. And what happens is we use uh, logical operators, four logical operators, to connect the conditions uh, with the actions um, to be either taken or not taken. So for example, we'll look at the first one, real account active accounts, within limit, location OK. If all four of those things are true, we will approve the transaction. And you can see that, by the way, over here, this is column one in the decision table, right? All four of those things are true, we approve. OK, so that's shown here because what we've got, we've got the logical operator A causes B, that's here. And we've combined that with the AND logical operator, which is shown here, where, where A1 and A2 both have to be true for B to be true. You notice you've got this little carrot shape above the, this, uh, next to this arc. So the upward pointing carrot shape that looks kind of like letter A is, is the AND operator. So real account and active account and within limit and location OK cause approved to occur. That's what this reading this no, notation here. So that's a combination of the A causes B operator with the AND operator. Okay. So this is how those um, those four interact to result in a uh, approval. Now, we also have a not A causes B. So in other words, A has to be false for B to happen. A causes B means A has to be true for B to happen. And we see that here. If the account is not real or the account is not active, not real, or the account is not active, call the vendor. I right? now see the or operator. This is the thing that's upside the upside down here. It looks kind of like a V. So if it looks like an A, it's an AND, and if it looks